Hello and welcome to this Wise Owl Answers video. This question appeared on a video about using list box controls in Excel VBA user forms. And what Mark wanted to know was how to add a select all option to a list box without accidentally triggering a cascade of change events which leaves you stuck in an infinite loop. So we'll take a look at a solution to that problem in this video, but just before we get started, I wanted to take the opportunity to say a big thank you to Mark and to everyone else who's chosen to support the channel by becoming a channel member. Guys, everyone here at Wise Al sincerely appreciates the support and we hope you're enjoying the content we're producing in return. And I'm really enjoying seeing these little icons appear next to people's names in the channel comments. Anyway, onto the solution itself. I've started with a brand new blank workbook for this example, so you don't need any files to follow along with the video. I've saved mine as a macro enabled file and I've got the Visual Basic Editor already open. So I'm going to head into there and then start by inserting a new user form. So I'm going to right click into the Project Explorer, choose Insert User Form. I'm not going to spend any time formatting my forms and making them look attractive. I'm not even going to bother changing the form's name in this example. All I'm going to do is add a list box control by finding that in the toolbox. Click and drag on the form to draw my list box. And again, I'm not going to bother changing the list box name in the properties window, but there are two basic properties I do want to change. So scrolling down a little bit further, I'm going to find the list style property first, and I'm going to change the list style from plain to list style option. So that will prevent, present us with some check boxes to check when we, um, when we have the multi-select list box displayed. I'm then also going to find and change the multi-select property. So change multi-select from single to multi-select multi. And then the final thing we need to do before we can interact with our list box is populate it with some options. There are multiple ways we can do this, but I'm going to take the simple approach for this video. We're just going to add some code to the initialize event of the form to add some items to that list box. So I'm going to right click on the background of the form and choose to view its code. And then I want to access the initialize event rather than the click event, which is the default forms event. So from the drop down list up in the top right hand corner, I can choose initialize and then I can get rid of the click event entirely. I shan't need that. And then in the initialize event, I'm going to start by saying with and then look for my list box one object. And then inside there, I'm going to apply the add item method. The first item I want to add is going to be the select all option. I always want that one to appear at the top of my list. And then I can just copy and paste the add item line. And I'm just going to add three more options. It really doesn't matter what you choose to add in here. Make it the names of your pets or your children or your favorite pizza toppings. I'm going to go with a really inventive add items A and B and C. If you can think of anything more exciting than that, and you hopefully won't have to think too hard, then go with those instead. I'll close off my with block by saying end with. And then just to give this a quick basic test, I'm going to go back to the design view of the form by double clicking on it and then select the form's background and then run it by clicking the run button or pressing the F5 key. And hopefully we should see a list of four options that we can check and we can have a multi selection or a single selection, but the basic form is set up and working. Next, we need to make something happen whenever we select an option from the list box. So to get started with that, let's double click on the list box in design view to generate the default event handler for the list box, which happens to be the click event. Now this would be perfect if we were dealing with a single select list box, but with a multi select list box, the click event isn't actually triggered. What we need instead using the drop down list at the top right hand corner is the change event. So I'm going to select the change event from the drop down list. Then we can delete the click event entirely and then just add some basic code that's triggered whenever we change something in the list box. Let's add a message box. That'll be nice and obvious to start with. And it's just going to say list clicked. So it's going to be quite an annoying message. It's going to pop up every single time we select or deselect an option in the list. Let's run the form again by clicking the run button or pressing the F5 key. And then if we check the select all box, it says list clicked. If we uncheck select all, it says list clicked, select B, unselect B, etc. So the, the message pops up and is triggered every time something changes in this list box. 
Now for this example, I only want something to happen when I select the Select All option at the top of the list. So let's add a bit more code to identify the item that we've selected in the list box. If we head back to the same procedure we were just working on, the change event of list box one, rather than just showing list clicked, let's replace that with a few bits of information from the list box itself. So I'm going to refer to list box one, and then I'm going to refer to the list index property, first of all. So list index gives us the index number of the item we've picked. I'll then concatenate that with a space in some double quotes. And then I want to concatenate that with whether or not the item I've selected is checked or unchecked. So I can do that by saying list box one dot selected. This returns either true or false, depending on whether the item is checked or not. And in order to specify the item I'm interested in, I've got to pass in the index number of the item I, I want to interrogate. So I'm going to do that by passing in the list index property that I've just calculated there. So listbox1.selected, listbox1.listindex. And then finally, just to finish this off, let's also show the value of this item. So the text we've typed in next to it. So to do this, we can refer to listbox1.list. And once again, we've got to specify the index number of the item we, uh, we're interested in. So I'm going to copy and paste once again, listbox1.listindex. I can just about squeeze all that onto a single line, I think, and keep it in view. There we go. Okay. So having done that, we could head back to run the user form again. So let's run the form. And then if we check the a box, it gives us the index number, whether it's checked and what its value is. And we can uncheck that again and it switches the, the selector property back to false. So we can clearly see now that we can determine which item we've picked using those properties. So to narrow this down, to make sure that we're only going to run our code when we check the select all box, if I close down the form and then head back to the code we were writing, we can simply write an if statement that checks if listbox1.listindex equals zero. So it's a zero based index rather than a one based index. Then show that message box. Uh, otherwise we won't do anything. So I'll just add in the end if statement, run the user form again, and we'll see that if we check ABC, nothing happens. But if we check the select all option, it triggers our code and shows us that message. So there's our basic logic working. Next, we need to add the code that will process all of the other items in the list box if we've determined that we've selected or deselected the select all option. To do that, we can write a simple for next loop to count through the remaining items in the list box. So let's start by declaring a simple integer variable at the top of the subroutine. So we can say dim i as integer. And then inside the if statement, we can begin our for next loop by saying for i equals and then set the number that you want to start counting from. I don't want to bother including the select all option, so I'm, I'm not going to start counting from zero here. I'll start counting from number one, which will be the second item in my list box. Then I want to carry on counting to the index number of the last item in the list box. And to do that, I can say list box one dot list count, which will tell me the total number of items. So that'll be four. And if I subtract one from that property, that will give me the index number of the last item. Let's just close off that loop then. I'm going to indent the message box line and then say next i to move on to the next number. And I don't want to see a separate message box for each item in my list. So let's just change this to the more convenient debug.print. And then we can print out the value of our i variable. And then the selected status of the item at the so, uh, specified index of i, and then the value of the item in the list at the specified index of i as well. Okay, so if we run the subroutine at this point, uh, sorry, the form, I should say, I'm just going to check the a and the c boxes, which won't have done anything yet to the, uh, to the code because that's not option number zero. But if I check the select all box, and then I uncheck A and uncheck C and check B, and then uncheck the select all box. 
when I close down the user form and return to the Visual Basic Editor, I should see two sets of numbers one, two, and three. So the first set is printed out when I checked the Select All box for the first time, and then the second set printed out when I unchecked the Select All box. So that code looks like it's working correctly. OK, now for the slightly tricky part. Rather than just printing out the current status of all the other items in the list, I want to change the status of the selected property of all of the other items in the list box to the same selected status as item number zero. So let's just modify the debug.print statement. I'm going to get rid of debug.print and all the extra bits of information there. And we're going to change the selected property of item number i to be equal to the selected property of item number zero. So this box one dot selected zero was what I was going for there. OK, now this is where the problem's going to occur. I'm going to set a breakpoint on this line. I can do this in a couple of ways, either by clicking on the grey bar to the left or by pressing the F9 key to toggle a breakpoint with the selected line. The problem here is that this line of code is going to change the property of an item in the list box, which is going to trigger the change event, as you will hopefully see. If I run this user form and then I, let's say I'm going to check just the select all box to begin with, you can see it's run up to this point and I'm about to change the selected property of item number one. So it's going to change the selected property of item A. So if I press the F8 key to trigger that line, you can see it goes back and it triggers the change event. So it's going to then go through, starting at number one again, and then it's going to change the status, selected status of item A to the same as the uh, selected status of the select all option, which will trigger the change event again. And it doesn't matter at this point, I can carry on pressing F8, I'll never escape. This is my, not quite an infinite loop, I'm in this uh, sort of cascading sequence of events where changing a property triggers the same event and I can never get past that point. So I'm going to stop running the subroutine at that point. Let's just reset it. And then back in the Visual Basic Editor, let's get rid of that breakpoint temporarily as well. So we need some way to prevent this line of code from endlessly triggering the same change event. One approach to doing that is to use a variable declared at the top of the module or the top of the form, which acts as a toggle, which determines whether we will exit from the change event each time it's called. So to get started with that, let's declare the variable. I'll declare this as a private variable at the top of the form. I'm going to call it change event disabled. Nice descriptive name. And the data type of this is going to be Boolean. So the default value of that Boolean variable will be false when the form first loads. If you wanted to set a different value for the property or the, for the variable, you can set that in the initialize event of the form in the same way we add, added the items to the list box. But false is the default value that I wanted. Whenever we call the change event then, after I've declared the variables, but before I do any other code, I'm going to check if change event disabled then exit from the subroutine. So if the value of change event disabled equals true, then it will exit from the sub at that point, thus it won't continue into this if statement or that loop. So we then need to add some code that's going to change the value of change event disabled. I want to change the value of that variable to be equal to true whenever I select or deselect the select all option. So inside the if statement, before I begin looping, I'm going to say change event disabled equals true. And then once I finish looping, I'm going to say change event disabled equals false again. Just to demonstrate what happens then, I'm going to set a, a breakpoint on the first if statement now in that change event. Then I'm going to run the user form by clicking the run button, and I'm going to check the select all box. So we saw, or I mentioned that change event disabled, the default value of that will be false when the form first loads. So because it's false, it's not going to exit the subroutine at this point. It's going to proceed, it's going to check, have I just changed the select all option, which I have. So it's going to go into this if statement, and then it's going to change 
the value of this variable to be true. Then it's going to start processing the other items in the list. So it's going to go to the A option and it's going to set the value or the selected property of the A option to the same as this, the selected property of the select all option, which is going to trigger the list box one change event. So when I press F8 on this line, it makes another call to this change event. However, this time you can see that change event disabled equals true. So rather than continuing and getting back to this point and endlessly triggering itself, we're going to exit from the subroutine. It will then return to the next line after the one which called that change event and then move on to the next item in the list. So now I've moved on to item number two. It's going to change the value of that or the selector property of that, which triggers the change event. But change event disabled is still true. So we exit from the subroutine, move on to the next item in the list, change that one, which triggers the change event, which because change event disabled is still true, it exits from the subroutine. And then I've processed all the items in the list. So it sets change event disabled back to false and then ends the if statement and then ends the sub. And that's it, we're done. Um, it's a little more impressive, I think, when you actually see it working um, uh, at full speed. So if I head back to the form, which is still running in Excel, if I uncheck the box, it runs the subroutine again. I just want to run that entire thing all the way through. And then I should be able to just check and uncheck the box whenever I like to check and uncheck all the items. And it doesn't matter what the current status of all the items are in the list. If I uncheck select all, it sets all of the other items to unchecked. If I check select all, it sets all of the other items to checked. So there we go. There's the solution to our problem. So now that we have this safety net in place, we could change the way that the system works. We don't always have to set all of the other list box options to be the same as the select all option. What if, for example, we wanted to invert the selection instead of select all? So let's just change the, uh, the items in this, uh, sorry, the, the name of the first item from select all to invert selection. And then what we're going to do here is in the for next loop, we're going to say, um, rather than list box one selected I equals list box one selected I, we're going to set list box one selected I to be equal to not list box one selected I. So that will change the, uh, the true to a false and the false to a true. Again, that's going to trigger the change event, but with this, uh, this safety net in place, this toggle to disable the change event, we still won't run into the problem. So if we run the form and we check the box and uncheck the box, it inverts the selection as everything was unselected. It selects everything and then unselects them. But we can also have different combinations of options selected and find that we can invert those with that checkbox. So that's kind of a cool little feature. You can play around with this um, with that nice safety net in place so that you don't end up with this endlessly cascading sequence of events. So there we go. Hopefully that's enough to answer Mark's original question. But if not, as always, feel free to carry on asking more questions and I'll do my best to fill in some answers as and when I can. Thanks very much for watching. We'll see you next time.